Hello, I'm Tara McDonald, the lead gardener for the Good Shepherd Center located in the Wallingford neighborhood of Seattle. The Good Shepherd Center is an 11 .5 acre site of garden, park, and large Italianate style building. The site is almost entirely surrounded by stone walls, hedges, and tall trees so that from the outside one cannot tell what lies within. And once one steps through that garden wall, the mystery only expands. For the stately structure, diverse garden spaces, and old trees all hint at past activities and lives lived. Besides being a greatly appreciated green space and a cool building, this historic site has a story to tell. Indeed, it has many stories to tell. Today, we are going to focus on the big picture part of that story that explains its original development, who built it, how, and what for, and that ultimately enabled it to remain a green oasis to still be enjoyed today. My hope is that this site at least makes people question what it is, why, and what it can teach us. What does it tell us about our society? The Good Shepherd Center is a City of Seattle landmark and on the National Register of Historic Places. The site was developed in 1907 by the Sisters of the Good Shepherd as a home and school for girls and convent. The Congregation of the Sisters of the Good Shepherd was founded in 1835 in Anye, France by Mary Euphrasia Pelletier. The mission of the order was to provide shelter to girls and women from rough backgrounds where they could be rehabilitated into self-confident, competent women able to function in society. Pelletier was very specific in her approach to re-educating what was known as asocial women and girls. She had a very progressive understanding of human development and established comprehensive guidelines to be followed by all the homes. That approach set them apart from other groups doing similar work at the time and made them successful. The order grew quick, quickly and established homes around the world, including 59 in the United States. The order was first invited to establish a home in Seattle in 1890. They built the home of the Good Shepherd in Wallingford when their previous home on First Hill became crowded. This new building opened to 171 girls and 11 nuns. The new 11 and a half acre site in Wallingford had enough space for over 83,000 square feet of structures, a farm with animals and vegetables, extensive orchards and large recreation areas for the girls and sisters. The home was operated, operated for 66 years until it closed in 1973. During that time, it sheltered, counseled, and educated over 8,000 girls. It is a common misconception that it was a home for unwed mothers, but that was simply not the case. Pregnant girls were not sent here to have their babies. We say it housed girls from rough backgrounds, which is to say that many of the girls came from negligent or abusive households, or possibly just did not have a parent to care for them. They may have been sent to the home after running away, or being removed from their homes by social services. They may have been petty criminals or caught consorting with bad company. Jail would not have been appropriate for these girls, but neither was returning home. Some girls were placed in the home by their families for being a little too wild or incorrigible, or simply because they could not afford them and or lacked the ability to care for them. There were even some girls that referred themselves. They were simply girls from difficult situations. The young residents of the home got a bad rap for being de delinquent, but as the nuns would point out, in most cases, the girl herself is not the problem, but she has a problem too big for her to solve. Too often, the parents are the delinquents. Because of these difficult home situations, the girls often had no example of a functional home environment. The Good Shepherd Center's rehabilitation approach was to demonstrate the rewards for a good, well-managed home and a balanced life, including academic education and professional training, homemaking, and healthy recreation. They strove to make the home an attractive environment for the girls, both inside and out. The grounds, as well as the building, were developed in a homey manner. Their entire lives were contained within the garden walls, which were designed to keep them confined and safe. They were removed entirely from the negative influences where they came from. Many of the girls reported that the home was the first safe home that they had ever known. The hedges and fences surrounding the site set it apart from the surrounding city and continues even to today 
to provide a sense of refuge. Like the building itself, the grounds too had a formal front entrance to greet guests. As the public face of the home, the historic character was formal and meant to impress and convey the dignity of the institution. This space is an extension of the building facade. The function was to frame the building, but it was an entryway, not a living space. The entrance garden was separated from the actual living spaces of the grounds. The sisters and girls had separate outdoor recreation spaces to the north and west of the building. We know little about the nuns area except for what we can infer from aerial photos and site characteristics. The girls yard, however, was well photographed and talked about. They had a comprehensive recreation program extolled by the sisters in their 50th anniversary celebratory publication, the Jubilate Deo. The girls had a concrete double tennis court, two basketball courts, a baseball diamond, and as of 1959, a swimming pool. The concrete areas doubled as roller rinks and dance floors. They also had a pavilion that they called Paradise that provided a warm, dry space in winter and shade in summer. In there, they had shuffleboard, ping pong, a fireplace, and eventually an ice cream machine. In the corner of their playground was a grotto of Our Lady of Lords, surrounded by a garden of flowers and shrubs and a goldfish pond. The stone structure of the grotto remains, but the statue has been removed. We know there were Stations of the Cross and other statues placed around the grounds, but we have no records to indicate where. In both recreation spaces, there were flowers and ornamental shrubs to enhance the beauty of the landscape that they recreated in. Most of the property was set aside for food production, the bulk of which were orchards. This is the element most recognizable today, since some of the old tree fruit trees remain. The orchards once covered most of the west side of the site and the southeast and northeast corners. The southeast corner is now a main part, the main parking lot, but it is also still maintained as an orchard. And we celebrate these, the orchards every fall at our annual apple tasting event. In addition to the fruit trees, they raise vegetables, chickens, and in the early years, cows. Besides aerial photographs, I know of only one photo of this area before 1975. With few records, we know little about how the grounds, especially the orchards and farms, were maintained and by whom. We do not know what, to what extent the resident girls and nuns were involved with this area of the site. Our knowledge of the grounds comes from aerial photographs taken every decade from 1929 on, the assessor's record photos, and a relative few other photos, along with an oral history conducted by Toby Harris in 1999 where she interviewed former residents, nuns, and neighbors of the home. Our research is ongoing. If you have knowledge, photographs, or other resources for information about the home, we would love to hear from you. Among other things, the Home of the Good Shepherd in Seattle is an example of how we once addressed a societal issue, an issue that we continue to struggle with today. It represents not only the lives of over 8,000 girls who lived in this home, along with the nuns and Magdalens of the convent, but also that of the other 59 homes in the U.S. To my knowledge, it is the only Good Shepherd home in the U.S. preserved with the building and grounds intact, making it the prime example of this educational approach for all it might teach us, be it considered good or bad. While the legacy of Good Shepherd homes is mixed around the world, the reports we have of this home are generally positive. Accounts are largely that the home was a positive and life-changing experience for the better. This story should be learned and remembered. This talk was only a brief overview of the Good Shepherd Center's history. There is a lot more to learn about the other stories it has to tell and its importance to the community. To learn more, see the resource page at the end of the video and join one of Historic Seattle's annual spring garden tours. We do an on-site tour most springs in which we go into greater details about the garden, life in the home, the preservation of the site, and the development of the site over the past few decades and come visit any time to make a, take a stroll through the past and present.